we also, in the audience, we have uh, uh, Major Lori Mitchell, the Executive Director of the Salvation Army, Gail Farm, Community, Community Engagement, Manager of Community Engagement, that was at their event last night, thank you for coming out, and Jennifer DeBaker, representing Member of Parliament, Don Rasta. Welcome. And I uh, also want to thank all of you for coming out. And I'm going to introduce the panelists and thank you for joining us on this very important topic. As you can see, the, the turnout is great. Thank you for coming. And there has been a lot of engagement on social media already. I just want everybody to know that this is going to be live stream. It is being, we are live right now on Facebook, on my Facebook page, on Net News Ledger Facebook page and website. So there will probably be hundreds if not thousands of people that will be seeing this, not necessarily at the same time, but over the next few days. So this is just the beginning of a good community engagement and conversation on this very important topic. So I'm going to introduce uh, the panel, and then I'm going to give a brief introduction just to put things in context. Why we're here, what we hope to achieve, where do we go from here? As I said, this is just the beginning. This is very complex, as you know, and uh, we've got to start somewhere. And within the context of so many organizations that are doing such a great work already, you'll hear tonight from their perspective. My role is to facilitate and moderate. So I'm going to give you some quick highlights, and then we'll go to the panel. And uh, on the panel, we have uh, Mr. Wayne Gates. He's the chief of EMS on the left. On the left, Boni Kaisowiti. Sorry, I, I can't pronounce the last name. Okay, got it. Social researcher, planner, Lake Lake Ed Social Planning Council. Then Cynthia Olson, coordinator, Thunder Bay Drug Strategy from Corporate Strategic Services from the City of Thunder Bay. Next is uh, Christopher Musquash. Hope I get that one right. PhD. A doctor in psychology, Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Mental Health and Addiction. Last but not least, Janet Silman, VP of Addiction and Mental Health at St. Joe's Care Group. Thank you very much and welcome for your participation tonight. It's 10 after 7. We hope to go through the first page part of the evening by presenting and touching on some key points. The second part of the evening will be open to Q&A. For those who want to have a question, you can go up to that microphone and ask your question from there. We will alternate from those people who cannot make it here tonight, but who are on Facebook. I already received a couple of questions, but there may be more coming. So we have uh, Angela Taylor over there. Thanks for helping out. And if there are any Facebook questions, please bring them to me and uh, we'll bring it forward, and we hope the panel can answer those questions. So, while we're here, as you know, I want to start, just go back a little bit. About a month ago, I had a town hall meeting on eSafe for youth through smart technology, phone technology, and collaboration. The reason being, I'm also, the, besides being a counselor at large, I'm also the child and youth advocate for the city of Thunder Bay. So, as you know, we have had many incidents over the last few years, especially with youth who died, the tragedies that have happened. I think most of us are well aware of what has happened. So I wanted to eat, um, think in, in, in the discussions I've had over the years and months, with uh, many other groups, uh, we felt there was a, um, that we needed to do something different. What can we do? There is, the youth are very, they're using the technology very well, so we introduced it. And I had a town hall meeting. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But what emerged from that evening was that besides the focus on the youth, is the whole community that is going through some major changes, being mental health and addiction, being poverty, homelessness, and a host of other social issues. They all bind together to make a very difficult situation very complex. There are no easy answers. And I hope tonight we can get some clarity, one, on what is happening, what is being done, and where do we go from here. 
So at the end of the night, we can get those questions answered somehow. We have achieved our goal of what we hear tonight. Then we take it from there towards the future. So the, uh, I wanted to present this chart because most of some of you, if not all of you, have seen it. If you see in the circle, there is a, the red circle in the middle is a reactive incidents, immediate response. That's where the police comes in. There is an incident, the police is reacting, trying to, and also EMS, you'll see from the EMS presentation, there has been a surge of incidents where they had to go and provide their services. Then in the middle, risk mitigation, reduce, reduction of identified risk. The eSafe for youth it was more towards mitigating the risk, preventive measures that would prevent an incident from happening, where you can see a trend that you can react and provide the support needed to make sure that things don't escalate and happen and, and someone unfortunately dies. The green part is social development and the blue is, you know, is reducing identified risk. Tonight, we hope that we can concentrate on the prevention aspect of it. The idea is how can we move towards prevention instead of reaction? You all heard the theme of the saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So how can we move towards prevention? And it will alleviate many of the problems we're facing when we are on a treadmill reacting to events and it seems to be getting worse instead of better. What are some of the key community issues that we're facing in our city? You know, we know there's racism, trauma, adverse childhood, different experiences from different people from different backgrounds, poverty gaps, homelessness, youth substance use and abuse, gaps in the use and mental health. We need a continuum of support. There's uh, alcoholism, intoxication, drug use, opiates, crisis, and crime and victimization. All these things combined are creating some of the issues we're seeing today. What are the drivers, key community drivers, maybe in uh, providing solutions? Collaboration, in my mind, is key. Where we're dealing with complex issues in the private sector, having worked in, uh, for large companies and using best practices in how uh, solving difficult, challenging problems, they usually bring together what we call a cross-functional team. People from all different expertise combined, totally focused on solving one key problem. Well, I think that kind of collaboration and effort, what happened? Mm -hmm. The kind of collaboration is what is required to tackle some of these challenging issues. We have already initiated discussion, and it's not just me studying today. There has been an amazing amount of work over the last few years and many years at the federal, provincial, local level. Many organizations doing amazing work. You'll hear some of that tonight. We need to continue that, and uh, I hope that the panelists that now will give you their perspective will provide and shed more light on what is becoming a compelling issue for our city and region. So this is basically my context in which we will we'll move uh, forward towards the panel presentation. I'm going to pass it on now and uh, to Mr. Wayne Gates to present from EMS some of the, what you will see, dramatic uh, changes and increases that have occurred in the last few years. If you need this, pass the baton. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wayne Gates. I'm the Chief of Security at RPMS, and we provide paramedic services to the City of Thunder Bay as well as the District of Thunder Bay. The uh, presentation I'm going to do here tonight is mainly focused on the City of Thunder Bay. Uh, there are issues in the district as well, but the nice focus for me is what's going on in the city. I also want you to remember that I'm going to show you some numbers here. I think you'll be a little bit surprised. Uh, if you've been watching the news, you know there's been problems across this country uh, with drugs, etc. Thunder Bay is one of those problem spots. Please keep in mind these numbers are people. With someone's mother, 
husband, child, sister, brother, cousin. These numbers are actual people. And sometimes we lose focus on that. So, pressures on emergency services are growing quickly in Thunder Bay. Especially in the last five years, our call volume has been going up about 5 to 6% every year. This is happening in other jurisdictions as well, but Thunder Bay is a little bit unique. i give you an example. My counterpart in Durham, his call volume is going up like crazy. The main driver of that is baby boomers. How many baby boomers do you have in this room? <laughs> we're a problem. <laughs> Remember our parents said we were a problem? <laughs> they were a problem. Okay, so that's happening across the province. Remember they built all those schools for the baby boomers. What are they doing now? Closing down all those schools. Now they have to start building other so part of the key of our demand is the baby boomers. We're getting older, what happens when you get older? They start having more heart attacks, more stroke, more illnesses, all those things. It's a natural progression of life. My counterpart in Durham, what's happening with him is he's having baby boomers, but his population has grown as well. Durham is going up like 4 or 5% a year in population growth because of immigration and all that. Thunder Bay, we don't have that. We're flat. So we have a pressure from baby boomers, but we also have pressures from drug and alcohol. Down south, they have more pressures from the drugs, but here in Thunder Bay, we're trying to get hit from both sides of drugs and alcohol as well. And that's a huge uh, demand on the service industry. So, it's causing this increase in demand. Here's a little graph. You probably can't see those numbers from here. But this bar here, okay, this is 2017. The red bar is code four emergencies. That's just a little at uh, 19,000. So code four is what they call a life-threatening call. So that's when dispatch gets a 911 call in, they determine it might be life-threatening, and they send a paramedic out uh, life in sight. The yellow bar is what we call code three. So they're urgent calls. They're not life-threatening, but they're someone that you know, broke a leg, broke a finger, whatever. They're not going to die, but they do need some form of care in the hospital, so they're called urgent. These other little bars down here are just uh, what we call non-essential non calls or non-urgent calls, transfers, inter-facility transfers. So in 2012, my code fours were about 12,000, and my code threes were about 6,000. 2017, my code fours are 19,000. My code threes are about 7,500. So, in that span, that's how much our emergency demand has gone up. In Thunder Bay. In Thunder Bay. That's just the city alone. This does not include my district stats. This is just for the city of Thunder Bay. What's our population? 100,000, and we're doing, well, in 2017, we did a 27,000 emergency calls. A lot of those Yeah, and we'll get into that. When we break it down, and this is from uh, our dispatch, as you can see, so 68% of my calls that come in are life-threatening calls. So out of that total of 26,963 calls we did in 2017, 68% of them are life-threatening calls. That's from dispatch. Now, when we get there, less than 10% turn out to be truly life-threatening. 27% uh, were the urgent or those code three calls I told you about. And the dispatch problems, what they're being sent out for is, I know it's hard to see, but right here, we have a category called alcohol intoxication. That's from the dispatcher telling the crews it's alcohol intoxication, even before they get to the scene. 5% of that 26,900 calls, 5% of those are what the dispatchers determine is alcohol intoxication. So think of the numbers. And a lot more calls is when actually crews get there, they think they're going for something else, then it ends up to be an actual intoxication call or a drug overdose call. 
want to give you an indication of uh, EMS activation by age cohorts, we call it. So we broke it down into groups of age 1 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I want to show you this is there's been a change in our culture and what's going on. Normally, our highest end users are, you know, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90. You're getting older, you're getting sicker. You start having your heart attacks, those things. Of course, you're going to call 911, you're going to call EMS. This is normal. And as you can see, it is climbing higher. But this age group, why is it climbing higher? Baby boomers, right? So we knew this was coming. We were expecting this. We were prepared for it. We knew baby boomers were going to get older. It's coming. I'm one of them. But look here. See these two bars here? This is 21 to 30 and 31 to 40 year olds. They're almost equivalent up to 70 and 80 year olds for EMS activations. Think about that. How many people in this room when you were 30 called an ambulance? Or 20? So our call demand for this age cohort has gone way up. Why? That's part of the reason why you're here. This here is what we call uh, repeat users. So we have uh, the slang our, our paramedics will say is the regulars. We do have repeat users. And in 2016, we had about 160 repeat users where they, EMS was called for them 10 times or more. Okay, we have some people we get called 30, 40 times for. Okay, that's, that's nothing new. And you'll notice in 2017, that number actually went down a bit. And that was something we did with what we call the Community Paramedic Program, which was a, a pilot program that was uh, initiated by the ministry where we, had, uh, we went through our data to see some, who some of the repeat users are. And these repeat users aren't all just alcohol intoxication or, or drug overdoses. Or, or, or a lot of them were mental health problems. So older people, mental health problems, trying to connect them to the resources they need. So what do you do? EMS is a safety net, so they're calling us all the time. So part of the role of the community paramedicine program was to go out and connect with some of these more older people that were having, you know, they didn't have primary care or whatever, and they, you know, they were using the ambulance to get to the hospital to get care. And, you know, we made those links, and that's why you actually see this number start to go down. So that number's gone down because of our more baby boomers, older population. And a lot of those people are, they don't have family here. Their kids aren't here anymore. They're single, they're by themselves, they have no one. So, so that's, a, I'm really uh, happy with the community paramedic program. We're hoping to expand it. Uh, fund, our funding coming, comes through the LIN. So we're putting in business cases. So I actually hope we get a few more of those people out there to kind of help with, the, with that baby boomer and the elderly population. Trends in EMS activation by age cohort. So I wanted to show you a comparison. So the blue is 2012. So in 2012, here's our 20 to 30 year olds and our 30 to 40 year olds. Look at the blue where the bars are. Look at 2017, how much it's changed. In fact, it's caught up to our 80 and 90 year olds. So. But again, remember, these are people. I'm talking numbers here, but every one of those persons is a father, a son, a daughter, a mother. They're somebody. Compared 2012 to 2017, for that same age cohort, the number one call was for injuries, trauma. So, as you know, 20 year olds. You know, I was 20 year old at one time. We're always not the brightest. Even when I got 30, I still wasn't the brightest. And we tend to get hurt. You know, we're skidooing. We do all those silly things that our parents told us not to do. And we get hurt, so we break legs and all that. So in 2012, 14% of those activations were for those type of injuries. In 2017, 13% of them were for alcohol intoxication. It's totally switched around for why we're being called. 
And that doesn't include the drugs and overdose. That's just alcohol intoxication with that age cold. So when we look at alcohol and drug poisoning for EMS activations, and we, I'll be honest, we have a lot of calls. We don't know if they have drugs on board. So in our database, we look at ones where we're pretty confident there's drug or alcohol on board, but a lot of them, a lot of, if we go to a death, we don't list it as a drug overdose because we can't confirm that. That's something the coroner has to do. But for the ones we're pretty sure on, again, look at the numbers and how that keeps climbing. So this blue bar, that's our alcohol calls. And right above here, we're at 1,800. So in 2016, we responded to 1,800 alcohol calls. And that's, you know, that was pure alcohol incident. That's not someone got in a fight, got beat up, and because there's a bunch of drunks. That's someone that is just, you know, clearly alcohol intoxication. We have a whole bunch of other calls where alcohol is involved, but that's not the primary problem because someone decides to beat them up. That's their primary problem. So that's just straight alcohol. And this lower bar here is, the green one, drugs. Now as you can see, it was up about 300, came down a little bit, came down a little bit. All of a sudden in 2017, our drugs go up, our alcohol goes down. Why? I'm sure there's a whole host of reasons out there, so. But you know, that shows a, a trend that's uh, a little bit troubling. If we can uh, leave the questions for after all the panels, panels have uh, presented, we move into the second phase so that people can ask questions then. Okay. Just keep in mind what you wanted to ask. This way, we separate the presentation from the Q&A at the end of uh, the second part. Thanks. So another thing you'll notice here is this is what we call the off-hold delay. So uh, I'm sure all you have heard how busy Thunder Bay region is. It's one of the busiest places in the province. A lot of people say it wasn't built big enough. I'm the chief of EMS, so I can tell you it was built big enough. The problem is the beds are being used for the wrong reasons. And hence they get plugged up with alternate level of care beds that should be uh, other places. And that's what's causing the, our awful delay. So emergency department, it fills up with people. They can't move people out. So my paramedics get stuck in awful delays. And in 2017, it's fight for well over 4,000 hours. So to put that in perspective, that's like parking an ambulance with two paramedics 24 hours a day for six months in eMERGE. That's how much time that is. So I mentioned the community paramedicine program earlier. Again, that's part of our, that's for more the, the senior population to help us kind of reduce the demand there so we connect them with primary care. We do fall risk assessment. We do follow up with them. We do remote monitoring. And that has a little bit of an impact as I showed you earlier in the graph. But that does not address our big challenge, which of course is why we're all here tonight. The alcohol and drug problem we're having in Thunder Bay. So, uh, questions, comments later on, and I always have to do this plug, I'm sorry, you know, I know this is a long no problem, but I always do this, okay, you don't know CPR, please learn CPR, <laughs> you never know. Thank you, Chief Gates, much appreciated, and now we call Boney uh, to make a presentation, there's no specific sequence here, we just go from your next point and then we'll continue going that way. Any questions you may have, write them down and then as we finish the presentation, we'll go to Q&A. Are you going to set me up? Um, PowerPoint for I think you're 
This is the bottom one. No. Yeah, that one's mine. That one's mine. Yeah. Right. Hi everybody, I'm Bonnie Krisawadi. I work at the Lakehead Social Planning Council. I'm the social researcher there. Um, and I'm also the coordinator of the Poverty Reduction Strategy in Thunder Bay. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about homelessness and poverty in Thunder Bay, um, give you some facts and some information. Um, and if you have any questions, as the councillor said, we can save them till the end. Um, so when we talk about poverty, we really need to understand what we're talking about. Um, because you can say your next door neighbor is living in poverty, your children are living in poverty, but what does that really mean? So there's two, there are two types of poverty that we can talk about. There's absolute poverty, um, which is um, where, where somebody has nothing. There's no housing, there's no um, support, no food, no clothing. Um, it's absolute poverty. There's absolute enough, absolutely nothing. Um, but what we see in Thunder Bay is mostly relative poverty. Um, and so we have to come up with a definition of relative poverty. So the definition that we use um, in Canada is um, the low income measure. And that's the um, definition that Statistics Canada uses. Um, so right now, the low income measure for a single person in Canada is $22,133 for a single person. Um, which, as you know, is not much money. So really, even if you are earning a bit more, you might say somebody's living in poverty, but by definition, um, they're not. So something to keep in mind um, when we're talking about things like raising social assistance rates to bring people up to the low-income measure, are we, really people, are we really talking about giving people a living wage um, where they're able to afford everything to be able to meet all the social determinants of health. And what I mean by that is adequate housing, adequate income, um, the ability to get an education, um, the ability to have um, positive early childhood experiences, the ability to have a support system around you. Um, so those things are really important to be able, for people to be able to succeed. Um, so a lot of the information that we get about poverty in Thunder Bay comes from the Community Volunteer Income Tax Program at the Lakehead Social Planning Council. We're very lucky to have this program in Thunder Bay because we do, um, we, I say we, but they, <laughs> um, they, the uh, volunteers of the program actually complete, well last year they completed more than 6,000 income tax returns for people in Thunder Bay and a few in the district and this year um, we're looking at already the numbers are higher so we'll be, or they will be doing more than um, completing more than 6,000 income tax returns. Um, and so that's really important for Thunder Bay. First of all, we can get data from 6,000 people in Thunder Bay. Um, and that's a really high number because when we just talked about the population of Thunder Bay being about 100,000, and about 15,000 of those people are living below the low income measure, and we're gaining statistics on 6,000 or more of those people. So we have really robust st statistics. We really have a good picture of what's happening with people that are living below the low income measure in Thunder Bay. So let's talk about what the income tax clinic means for all of us, for people that don't use the income tax clinic, but also for those that do. <coughs> So the Lakehead Social Planning Council's Income Tax Clinic um, is able to um, complete these income tax returns so people can get the benefits that are allowed to them. Things like the GST benefit, the Trillium benefit, the Canadian Child Tax Benefit. Um, and you can see here in this, um, uh, right here, I mean it generated more than half a million dollars in benefits in 2013 in Thunder Bay. Um, and then last year, almost $700,000 in benefits in Thunder Bay. And what's important to know about that is that studies show that folks earning less than $40,000 a year, which is who we're talking about here, spend 100% of their income locally. Um, even their debt is local. It's actually 106% of their income. Whereas people that earn more than $90,000 a year or more spend um, only 60% of their income locally. 
So we can be assured that most of that $687,000 was spent locally in Thunder Bay. And Lakehead Social Planning Council isn't the only, um, only organization that's helping people gain benefits. Kinaway, a legal clinic, was able to help people in the district um, of Thunder Bay and the city obtain more than $1.2 million in retroactive benefit payments, which resulted in about $53,000 in monthly payments for people in Thunder Bay, um, which works out to about another $637,000 annually. So, the, you know, between the Income Ta the Out Lake and Social Planning Council and Kinaway, a legal clinic, we were able to provide people with $1.2 million in benefits that was likely spent in Thunder Bay. So let's talk about who's living below the low income measure. And really there are three key um, groups that we see um, living below the low income measure in Thunder Bay and also provincially and nationally, and this won't be a surprise to any of you, I'm sure. Um, one of them is women. Um, and I, you can see on the, the statistics here is that um, uh, 21 percent of single mothers are living below the low income measure, 36 percent of indigenous women are living below the low income measure, um, and women who work full time earn 71 cents for every dollar um, her male counterpart earns. And you can say, yeah, 71 cents, big deal, what does that really mean? What it means is that I will have to work an extra 14 years to earn what my male counterpart would earn by the age of 65. So if, if you um, have a female in your house earning money, you can be guaranteed that she's earning about 30% less than her male counterparts. Another demographic that we need to really focus on um, locally when we talk about um, poverty <coughs> is uh, youth. And um, Councillor mentioned that earlier. Um, also, um, 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 Mr. Gates uh, mentioned that earlier too, um, that youth calls were going up. So um, you can see the statistics here. One of the most grave ones is that one in two status first nations children are living below the low income measure. So that's 50% of the children that are uh, status first nations. Um, children with disabilities are twice as likely to live in households relying on social assistance. And just to let you know, social assistance payments are about $350 a month right now. If we were to raise, if social assistance rates were to raise today to what the um, uh, inflation rate is, they would have to raise those rates by 41%. So there were major cuts made with social assistance um, a, a few years ago, and that really um, put a lot of people in poverty, um, which, which um, was uh, very detrimental, not to just those folks, but also all of us. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and you can see that um, when we get our statistics from the income tax clinic, we can see that 38% um, um, of people that had income tax returns had at least one child living with them um, in the household. So a lot of people having their income tax returns done living below the low income measure do have children living in the household. Um, the third dem demographic that um, we really focus on are Indigenous people. Um, so there is a lot of um, data around Indigenous people in poverty, but I think that one thing that we really need to know in Thunder Bay is that our population is about 100,000 people. And about 12% of those people, give or take a couple of percent, are Indigenous. But more than 50% of the people living below the low income measure in Thunder Bay are Indigenous. So there's a huge, huge disparity there. Um, so we really need to look at the issues around poverty for Indigenous people. Um, so um, I just wanted to mention that. Um, also to some of the other information that we get from our income tax clinic um, are things like average earning, uh, employment earnings for people. So you can see that the average employment earnings for a person that used the income tax clinic in 2016 was only $8,992 a year. So when we talk about the working poor in Thunder Bay, I'm sure you've heard that term before, these are people that are working and living below the low income measure. People that are working and unable to pay their bills, people that are working and unable to buy food for themselves um, or their children, etc. cetera. Um, another great statistic uh, are the um, average OAS or um, old age security earnings for those 65 years of age and over. 
and um, we're looking at about $6,500 a year. And you can see ODSP earnings, again, $12,000 a year on average. Ontario Works earnings or social assistance welfare, um, only about $7,000 a year in earnings. Um, again, social housing waitlist in Thunder Bay, we know homelessness is a big issue. We, have, we had our um, homelessness enumeration last weekend, but we know that there's, um, as of the last quarterly report, from the Thunder Bay District Social Services Administration Board, which was in December, there were over 1,000 people in our city waiting for social housing. Um, food security, again, another uh, more grave statistics. We can see um, 9,000 emergency meals served each month in Thunder Bay. There's more than 3,400 people that access food banks per month in Thunder Bay. And one in 10 households in Thunder Bay are not accessed are not able to access healthy foods, they are insecure, uh, food insecure. So the last slide is just really talking about the cost of poverty. You can see here the annual cost of poverty in Canada, Canada and I gave the, um, the low statistic, but the high one is $84 billion a year, but I usually report on $75 billion a year in case anyone wants to argue that few billion with me. But what does that mean for us? For each person in Ontario, it costs us individually between $2,300 and $2,900 a year. And what that equates to are things like those EMS calls that uh, Wayne Gates was talking about earlier. And some of our other panelists will talk about um, reasons for um, that cost of poverty. Um, keeping a person in shelter for one year costs $42,000. So there's a lot of grave statistics. If you want to see more of these statistics, you can go onto the LSPC website, www.lspc.ca, and you can see all of these statistics in our annual report. And again, uh, uh, Councillor talked about collective impact. Many, many partners contribute to the poverty reduction strategy in Thunder Bay. Um, we have a committee, but we also rely on other partnering organizations um, to help us out um, with our goals and our recommendations as well. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Cynthia, next. Cynthia Olson, Thunder Bay Direct Strategy. If you can project your voice so that people on Facebook can hear. Fortunately, there is. You have a wireless microphone there somewhere, right? Yeah, I have. <coughs> Let's use it. Yeah, this way we'll get picked up more, oh, better. <laughs> Is this on? Yeah, Let's bring it closer, yeah. Oh, I'll have to put it right up here, eh? Okay, um, hi everyone, I'm Cynthia Olson, and I coordinate the Municipal Drug Strategy for the City of Thunder Bay. Um, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to touch on that aren't in my presentation, and so before I lose train of thought on them, um, I decided to not focus my presentation on all of the statistics. We did do a lot of work on compiling the statistics to help inform our newest strategy. Um, I do encourage you, if you're interested, you can go onto our website and we have the check-in 2012-2016. It's a closer look at substance use and related harms in Thunder Bay. Um, some of the data is uh, captured um, under each of our pillars. But I wanted to, to mention that some of the, the themes that we're hearing about is increased calls, um, decreased access for services. And one thing that's um, really important to, to know is that there hasn't been any funding increases in years and years and years to the mental health and substance use systems at all. For the first time, the provincial government has announced in their newest budget that there will be a, a 4% or 5% if it goes through. Uh, base funding increase, which means that for the first time in years, organizations who are just, you know, trying their best to do what they can will maybe see an increase and maybe that will have an impact on our community. We need to continue to advocate to the provincial and federal governments for increased funding for these types of things along with housing. The other thing um, I also wanted to mention is sometimes, so some of the, po uh, the poverty statistics that Bonnie was sharing is just that there are policies in place with some of these systems that are set up to assist individuals, but they're actually very oppressive policies that keep people stuck. And, and yet, 
Um, from the outside looking in, sometimes we put stigma and like, why can't somebody just pull themselves up by the bootstraps? And that's not the case. There is just this whole momentum of keeping people stuck that doesn't allow for change to happen. So I just wanted to make those two notes before I go on to mine. Okay, so the Thunder Bay Drug Strategy was actually initiated in 2009 uh, through a Health Canada grant for three years. Um, 350 different individuals were uh, consulted within our community. There was 26 different focus groups. Uh, they researched the evidence uh, to look at best and promising practices to address substance-related harms at a community level. Uh, that strategy resulted in what was called the Roadmap for Change, and it was released to the community in 2011. It was originally situated out of the um, Thunder Bay District Health Unit and was endorsed by the Board of Health, and then it was presented to City Council and was endorsed by Council as the official community plan to address substance-related harms. So the data that we had looked at was back from about 2009, so fast forward, we're now in 2018. Just at the end of 2016, our drug strategy decided it was time to relook at the information that was within our community, help us to relook at those recommendations that we had. Our first strategy was very large. There was 112 recommendations. And we decided that we would refine it, um, help narrow the focus in, and have a more strategic direction on the work that we wanted to do in the community. We take a five-pillar approach. Most drug strategies uh, across Canada um, only focus on four. Is the red button the pointer? Yeah. So harm reduction, prevention, treatment, enforcement are the general um, focus of most municipal drug strategies. Our strategy decided to adopt a fifth pillar, housing, recognizing that individuals in our community who struggle with substance use, mental health, and a whole host of other complex issues cannot get well unless they have safe, adequate and affordable housing. And I say safe, adequate and affordable. All three of those conditions are important for us to get well or to maintain and thrive in a community. There are many individuals who have housing that may be affordable, but it is extremely unsafe. Or they may have housing that's affordable and may be safe, but there's five people in a one bedroom apartment. That's inadequate in, in our view and people can't get well that way. So this is how our drug strategy is structured. In the renewal of our strategy, we uh, came up with six recommendations under five pillars. So we now have 30 recommendations to kind of narrow the focus in on what we want to work on. We have an implementation panel that consists of 35 different partner organizations. Uh, we have multiple working groups. Our panel meets quarterly. We have a drug awareness committee, it's a pre-existing committee in the community and it focuses on prevention and education around substance use issues. We have the Housing and Homelessness Coalition, it is also a pre-existing coalition in our community that has existed for 20 plus years and it's focused on housing and advocacy and that acts as our housing pillar. It also acts as the housing pillar for the poverty reduction strategy. Um, in our most recent iteration of our strategy, we recognize that alcohol was a very pressing issue for our community. And so we actually have a dedicated working group around alcohol and some specific recommendations that span the pillars, um, but that the alcohol working group is focused on trying to achieve over the next several years. We have also proposed that we need to develop a treatment working group. We are in the process of connecting with the district, Thunder Bay District Addiction and Mental Health Network to act as that uh, working group to implement specific recommendations that are contained in our strategy that relate to treatment options in the community. We also have a youth engagement working group. We, we recognize that there are unique factors around youth and substance use and mental health. Um, and, and we wanted to better hear uh, from youth and learn ways on how we can further engage youth in the answers in our community. So we hired, a, I'll actually talk about that after. So we have actually a new group called Youth Life and it's a youth advisory committee. It just started and community groups who are working on um, substance use, mental health, or any youth-led initiative can actually access this group and have input from them on the design, 
um, and implementation of, say, your program or service. We also <coughs> notice that we have a significant, um, very marginalized group of individuals who are women who are pregnant or parenting, who struggle with substance use issues. Um, and we need to un better understand how to support them and their children in order to improve health outcomes for all, in, all of their family in the community. And then we have a, a harm reduction working group that is focused, just as it says, on harm reduction initiatives in our community. Out of our Housing and Homelessness Coalition, we also, <laughs> as a strategy, believe that it's extremely important to hear from individuals with lived experience. Nothing for us without us. And so we have actually created a community, pe uh, people with lived experience community advisory group. It's nine individuals who have a whole host of different uh, lived experience from poverty to homelessness, uh, difficulties with uh, mental health or substance use. Uh, they range in age, gender, uh, ethnicity, and they actually have been very, very useful in they meet monthly and we can bring questions and um, gather their input on the work that we do in the community. And many different um, organizations have actually accessed that group to help inform things like how would be best to reach out to you? What kind of uh, brochure would catch your eye so that you would actually use this service in this community? Um, and then we also, because opioids are a specific ta um, issue in our community, the Opioid Task Force was established uh, just last summer. We work very hard at advocacy. <coughs> We've advocated for improved access to naloxone. Um, we advocated for the development of a provincial overdose uh, coordinator and action plan for a federal housing strategy. These two have actually occurred. We have a, an overdose prevention coordinator in Ontario and the release of the federal housing strategy happened last year. Not saying that we did that, but we participated in advocating for it. As well as the renewal of a four pillar national drug strategy. Prior to uh, the, the recent federal government, harm reduction was stripped from the national drug strategy as was the funding. Um, it has been renewed and harm reduction has re been reinserted into that. And then uh, cannabis, legalization, our drug strategy has continued to participate in providing feedback on the both federal and provincial consultations <coughs> around the legalization of it. So this is some of the work that we've done um, under our prevention pillar. Uh, these are just a snapshot of the four, four of our six recommendations. If you see stars, that means the community also identified those as priority when we did community consultation on our new recommendations. But through our prevention working group, we've developed resources uh, such as the Trends and Promising Practices in School-Based Substance Misuse Prevention. We've initiated a Recovery Day movement to talk about the fact that people can and do recover from substance use mental health. And there are thousands living in our community and it's not the topic that we often talk about. We sensationalize the problems associated with substance use, yet we should sensationalize the fact that people are in recovery. <coughs> Under treatment, we have one of the recommendations was the establishment of the managed alcohol program and that came to fruition. We know that it still does lack permanent funding so we will still advocate for that. We continue to work with youth to better hear what they need from us as a community. Uh, we also participated in the pilot, which is now a full-time permanent expansion of uh, Balmoral detox services in the community. Harm reduction, we continue to work around uh, better understanding supervised injection services and how this can actually support individuals, both the community and individuals who use substances. Um, overdoses, as uh, Wayne was talking about, this is 37 t-shirts uh, for 2013. They said mother, son, daughter, brother. That's 37 people who died in our community from a drug overdose. We started an naloxone program in 2013 to help save lives. Under enforcement, we have the same symbol here. This is a new initiative that's going on in the community about, it's called Community Mobilization Network. And if we did not have this green layer, which is the work that many of these strategies in our community does, this red would be the size of all the way to the blue. So the fact that there is stuff happening 
and the work that we are doing helps shrink that red circle. And we want to continue to do that to make that red circle go even further. Under housing, uh, just some research around managed alcohol, uh, point in time count, we need to secure funding for programs like SOS. Uh, and we recognize that there's actually a lack of recovery housing for families. Excuse me. Yep, I am. Can you rip her? Yep. <laughs> Children and youth, maternal child health. Another big thing that we've worked on is for, uh, working with the Crime Prevention Council. We hi hire annually uh, youth, sorry, not youth, community safety ambassadors who work in the downtown South Core, Bay Algoma area, and downtown North Core, and they help clean up the neighborhood, engage with the community, and that promotes a safer <coughs> community. We also work very closely with the poverty reduction strategy, crime prevention strategy, and the Aboriginal liaison strategy, and they all intersect with the work that we do in the community. And thank you. I know there's a lot of work going on, but if we can leave some of that, I think there's more, uh, leave some to the questions, so we can expand on the specifics of the questions. So we're receiving a lot of information, but I appreciate it. So uh, we now have uh, Dr. Christopher Bushquash. Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, you can hear me okay? Thank you, uh, Councillor Pulley, for uh, organizing the Town Hall. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel. Uh, it's a privilege for, uh, for me to be here, um, and thanks to each of you on the, on the panel as well. I, I've worked with everyone here in some capacity, and, and what you begin to recognize is that when you're kind of working on these different things is that the, little community, bit closer, the community of people yeah. working on these thank things you. is quite small, so there's a lot of overlap in the things that we do. But also, I want to thank each of you for being here. Um, you know, clearly this is an important topic for everybody, and, 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 and people really care about Thunder Bay. And, and, we really care about our community and we really want to see um, the people that are living in our community do, do, do really well. I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking, you're, you're seeing the data, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, I can talk about the data as, as well in some of my research and, and, and that might be useful more in the uh, question and answer period. So I'll briefly just tell you a little bit about what I do and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass the microphone along. Um, so I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Lakehead University in the Northern Ontario School of Medicine as well. Um, and a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Mental Health and Addiction. So my work uh, is, is, is across a, a number of different areas. I, I teach at the university, so um, I actually there's, there's students of mine in the, in, the, in the room right now, which is really, really positive to see. Um, that's part of what I do. Um, and then the other big part of what I do is, is, is research. And, uh, and my research is, is, is largely focused within the areas of mental health and addiction, but also spans a, a whole bunch of other different areas. So I collaborate, uh, of course, with, with Cynthia on, on uh, um, looking at um, community engagement and other, other things that help bring uh, conversation together around how to solve issues um, with, with Bonnie uh, over here on managed alcohol um, and then nationally, provincially and nationally on, on issues like uh, chronic health uh, uh, issues and, and, and other things, um, 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 housing that, uh, that sort of uh, relate. The other thing I do is, is, is uh, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist and I provide assessment and, uh, and treatment and consultation services to uh, um, First Nations uh, children, adolescents, and adults uh, in the city at, at Deliquid Anishinaabeg Family Care. Um, um, so my role there is to, is to try to bring the very best um, clinical evidence that we have um, for, for solving uh, difficulties once they've occurred, but also bring the very best of, of the cultural evidence um, that, that, that we have to help uh, people um, regain some um, some um, control and, 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 and pursue the pathways that they wish to pursue uh, in their healing. Uh, so that's quite broad, um, but it's a, a, an overview of, of, of some of the things that I'm doing. Um, and I, I'm most interested in the in the question and answer and, and conversation part. So I hope to I hope to engage with people uh, around questions uh, uh, related to the areas that I'm working in as we as we continue the discussion. So. Uh, too much for um, uh, me here, and I'll, I'll turn the microphone over.
St. Joseph's Care Group. I think it's important that you have a sense of what we do. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, crime and uh, what people believe is the relationship between crime and mental health and substance use issues and perhaps some myths there um, and some linkages. And then, uh, and then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what we can do. And Frank, I think this will take us further into um, a question and answer um, period here. And so St. Joseph's Care Group, and I'm just going to be quick here, is a multi-site, multi-service healthcare corporation. Um, we provide services to a full range of individuals, um, from youth, very young children, um, and, and adolescents who have substance use and mental health issues, chronic diseases, all the way to seniors um, who need uh, supportive housing. So we work with vulnerable populations, for sure. And really the mission, and people know that St. Joseph's Care Group is, um, is a, um, a, a facility of the Sisters of St. Joseph, and their mission has been for many, many years to meet unmet needs, and we're still, uh, we're still working on that for sure, and we'll continue to do that for the next 135 years. Mm -hmm. I won't be here. Um, a little bit about our strategic directions, and I think it's important. Um, our board of directors established in 2016 a new set of strategic directions. And just quickly with this, our focus, and um, you can't see it. Uh, that's not going to work. Oh, there it is. Um, here for our clients, here for um, our people, so the people who provide services. Here for our partners, and that's really for our community and all the people with whom we work. And here for our future, and I think that's really important in the context of this um, session tonight, is that we're not just talking about things that we're doing now, it's talking about what we can do in the future and looking forward to um, what will the future be like and what can we do as, um, as community citizens and others to, um, to really improve the future and our vision. The core services within St. Joseph's Care Group, again, quickly, rehabilitative care, chronic disease management. Most of those services are provided at St. Joseph's Hospital, Seniors Health, and these will be our long-term care homes. And the area which is my portfolio is addictions and mental health. And a little bit more, again, about St. Joseph's Care Group, and I think this is important to know, that within a year, we serve 24,000 clients. 24,000, our population is just a little over 100,000. So we do provide a big chunk of services to individuals in our, in our community. People who don't necessarily need acute care, but who need support and health care services when they're outside of the um, acute care sector. A little bit about our um, satisfaction survey. So most people would say that uh, they would recommend our program to others. And then with respect to outside of the city of Thunder Bay, we have many specialized services. Um, and we reach out to all of Northwestern Ontario and are working really hard to engage with our partners in the far north. So our sites, um, the red circled ones are the ones where we provide addictions and mental health services. We're kind of all over the city. Um, I do want to say, and people will know that, some of our services are at Lakehead Psychiatric Hospital now and uh, within the next month, um, our um, inpatient mental health services will be switching over to St. Joseph's Hospital and Lakehead Psychiatric Hospital will um, close. We're not going to talk about that. Though. Let's move on. Addictions and mental health. So St. Joseph's Care Group, within my portfolio, we focus on three primary areas. Um, one is community mental health. And uh, these services are at St. Joseph's Health Center. It's primarily outpatient and outreach services. So individuals either come to see us in the, in the St. Joseph's Health Center or our staff go to people's homes, meet them where it's important for them to engage with counseling staff and nursing staff and psychiatrists. We have a street program as well, and we work with people, and we'll say that wherever they, wherever they need us, we'll engage with them. Um, concurrent disorders, so this is primarily Sister Margaret Smith Center, so that's addiction treatment for youth and for adults, inpatient, or sorry, residential and outpatient services, and Cynthia did mention the Moral Center, so it's a withdrawal management service, so when people require, and we use the word detox, and I know people understand that, but it is withdrawal management, we provide services right 
in uh, Balmoral Centre, we have day programs and we also reach out and support people to go through a withdrawal management process in their own homes. In mental health rehabilitation, we have inpatient beds at Lincoln Psychiatric Hospital and we have a number of programs where we support people to live in the community in, um, in their own home. So it could be apartment building um, but, but, or, um, or a home where five or six people are living together but we're supporting them to be healthy and well in their, um, in their home environment. I do want to um, just flip a little bit here and talk about um, crime and substance use. Um, and there's a question that I think is really important to ask. Um, and it comes up a lot. Do, does the use of drugs and alcohol lead to criminal activities? And I'm sure other people, myself included, have gone through the literature and the literature really says there's no clear answers. You can't directly link substance use to criminal activity. And I would say for sure, um, and this is in all the literature that I read, most people are a bit able to manage their drug and alcohol use without difficulty. Have a glass of wine um, and you're, you, you're, you're having a substance actually, or using a substance, um, smoking cigarettes, but it doesn't necessarily lead to um, difficulties in your life. Very few people will become drag regular drug and alcohol users and even fewer people will develop an addiction. So I think it's important to know that use of a substance isn't gonna make someone an, um, have an addiction and it's also not necessarily going to lead to criminal activity. And the other point that I've read, and I think it's really an interesting one, if we eliminated alcohol and drugs, we would still have criminal activity. So there isn't a direct link, a direct cause, um, causation. However, and the second big point here, evidence does show that there is a linkage to crime. And I think that's important. It's not a direct cause. If I have a glass of wine, I'm going to um, be involved in criminal, criminal activity. So crime is not the inevitable consequence to drug use. There are a co complex, a multitude of complex factors, and everyone here has talked about these complex factors. Poverty, absolutely. Lack of social values. Um, personality disorders or related psychiatric and mental health disorders. Association with drug users or people who are involved in criminal activity. And potentially loss of uh, contact with agents of socialization, family members, neighbors, and others. So it's a, it's a, it's a, again, a very complex uh, situation with complex factors and it's just not one factor that makes a difference. Frank, you said it earlier, and I'm going to repeat it. You said, where do we go from here? And you said, what could we, what should we do? And a number of things, and people have suggested these, and I'm just going to add a, a bit more. Um, there, are, there are lots of services. It's not enough, I will say, without a doubt. Um, and people did mention, Cynthia, I think it was you, just about the funding that's available and potentially new funding in the upcoming year. Um, over the past 30 years, and I know that's a long time, but if you think about it, 30 years ago, 11% of the provincial health budget was spent um, on mental health and addiction services. 30 years later, 6.5%. So that's, again, it may be more money, but it's a smaller proportion of the, um, of the provincial budget for health care spending. And we need to think about that and really advocate for, and I think everyone is saying that, for more resources. Um, so how do we do it? How do we change the system, improve the system um, of health care and mental health and addiction services. It's improve access, for sure, crisis services, including emergency and withdrawal management. Um, expand the range of counseling and treatment, so more opportunities for people. Expand treatment while people are incarcerated. And I don't have the statistics, and people talked about not necessarily having them, but there is a greater chance of being involved in the criminal system um, subsequent to um, being released from incarceration. So I think we need to think about more treatment while people are, um, are incarcerated. And then supporting transitions from treatment to living in the community. It actually takes, if someone is receiving substance use treatment, a couple of years for them to stabilize. But oftentimes they're in treatment for a small period of time and we need to support them for longer periods of time so that they can um, continue to be stable. Everyone talks about housing, and without a doubt, safe, affordable housing um, is really important with supports in place. 
um, and with, again, supports and clinical services for people who have coexisting substance use issues, mental health issues, and complex health issues. People who have substance use issues or mental health issues don't just have those issues. They have other really important issues. You may need to use a browser to gain access. Are we okay? Yes. I'm sorry? Just click back. Okay, I'm just going to keep on going. Um, and then building networks of social support and, um, I don't know what that word is. Well, that was easy. And meaningful relationships. People um, who are within the mental health and addiction system receiving services say without a doubt the most important things are the lives of having um, a home, a friend, and a job. And we tend to push people who have mental health and addiction issues outside of our social more social system, and we need to engage with them. Yes, Mama Sun Frank. Okay, the last slide, um, and Cynthia, you talked about this as well, um, and actually, Frank, you did this too, is, is I really believe that we can't just focus on treatment. We need to shift our work to prevention and early intervention. And Bonnie, you talked about the social determinants of health, and I, I think others have as well. The, it's important for all of us. So income, social status, social supports, education, employment, clean water, a place to live, all of those are important for all of us, and we need, the, need those for people who are living with mental health and addiction issues as well. And Frank, you talked about um, adverse childhood experiences, and I think this is important for all of us to recognize, is that the issues that people face with substance use and mental health issues, just, it just doesn't happen. It, is, it happens for a number of very complex reasons. And the literature out there shows absolutely that children who have experienced traumatic experiences in their lives are more likely to have poor physical um, and mental health outcomes later in life, more likely to have substance use issues. And these kinds of traumatic experiences include emotional and physical abuse, neglect, living at home with violence, having a parent with a mental illness, or having a parent or family member with a substance use issue. And so I think it's for all of us to take a look and say, with respect to children, early intervention and prevention, we need to start very, very young, not when they're already in their teens and older and, um, and having significant issues. And so my very last slide is that we all need to be part of the solution. Um, and I agree, it's been said a number of times. Um, it's, it's my mother, my father, my friend, my neighbor, um, my children, your children, your neighbors. Um, one in five individuals will experience a mental health and or substance use issue. I counted in the room, there's 50 people here. One in five would mean 10. 10 individuals have, in some point in their life, will have um, experienced or will experience a mental health or substance use issue. So it's not a standalone group over here, it's all of us, and it's important for all of us, regardless of what we do in our lives, to be involved in the solution. Thank you to our panel for your comprehensive uh, overview. As we mentioned before, these are complex issues. That's why it took a little bit longer to drill down into some of the key challenges we are facing as a community. So now we're going to open it up to the Q&A part. We'll stay here as long as there are people who have questions. I hope you can indulge us. Uh, there are uh, some questions that probably may not be under the your areas of responsibility, but I hope you know anyone can feel ready to jump in there and answer, feel free to do so. Um, I ask that everyone be respectful when you ask the questions. There are sometimes emotions because some people may have had some challenges themselves, difficulties, so please be respectful. Keep your questions short. We don't need the speeches, keep your questions short, and you'll get an answer. The answer also, please keep them concise, so we give everybody a chance to uh, participate. Before we go to the questions, I just want to start with one that I received uh, from uh, Facebook, and uh, we'll start with that, and then we'll open it up here to the floor. Uh, this is a tough one, but it speaks to some of the challenges. 
I can't make it to your event, but as someone with a disability, I can say that the rents are much higher than monies allotted through social services for rent. My income was so low that the city took my house only to pay five times more for my rent. Bureaucracy is forcing my handca handicapped daughter on the street. It's too complex for her to comply to ill-conceived, little thought out policies. Hope my message gets through. My thanks. So um, anyone can jump in, uh, as again, just comments, uh, again, may not be any solutions. We're not trying to address any specific problem of a specific individual. This is more of moving our community towards uh, some solutions. Thank you. So first off, uh, apologies to, to that individual who's uh, really struggling with housing and, and their daughter. And this was uh, somewhat to the point where I had opened before I even started, just talking about the, the policies within um, systems that are set up to assist individuals, sometimes further exacerbate issues. That individual may have been better supported in their current living conditions if they could have maintained possibly a mortgage, if they had have been allowed, um, sometimes you're not allowed to use a certain portion of your social assistance or disability if it exceeds, do you know what it is? Have to, if it exceeds a certain amount, they will say, we will not cover that. And so you, you know, it might be the only place you can find that is actually decent to live. Um, yes, it will put you short on finding food, or maybe clothes, but there are other places that individuals can go to access those other things. You can't go somewhere to access a decent place to live. So that's all I'll say to that. Um, yeah, and I think this also speaks to how important it is for all of us to advocate for higher social assistance rates, higher ODSP rates. Those rates are keeping people in poverty. Um, and uh, as um, you can see on the last slide, um, the social determinants of health can't be met if we are financially insecure. Um, so you are all able to help advocate when you see anything going on in the city, the poverty reduction strategy, the drug strategy, other strategies, um, are meeting with city council, are advocating with the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee constantly. Um, I'm presenting on May 14th to talk about um, trusteeship for seniors. Um, which I discussed earlier. So you are all able to help advocate for that. So whenever you see something going on, you can take part in that. Okay, let's go ahead. Hi, I'm Bruno. My name is Erin Bottle. Um, I represent uh, myself, I'm a mother, I have two kids. Um, I am the vice chair of the Urban Aboriginal Board. Uh, I've been a consecutive term, second year, uh, four years. Moved here in 2011. I've counted 84 deaths on the street. Um, on our own advocacy, uh, I command a team of 47 peacekeepers. I'm Ogachitakwe. My question for EMS is, are we gonna, what is your plan to have more Aboriginal recruitment for the paramedic program? Two, what is the city's drug strategy partnership with First Nations? Has it established a communication? It's, it has to be more than just a memorandum of communication because our services, we have two to three months of waiting time to access services as First Peoples in, in, in Canada. And as, as treaty partners, as treaty relations, it has to go beyond the scope of advocacy. It has to, it, the, the dialogue has to be from a medicine chest treaty relationship perspective because the Crown holds a lot of money from us as First Nations people. So from a citywide perspective and a person that has, that has seen our brothers and sisters lost to the street, my community lost eight last year to the street. And these are brothers and sisters that, that have fallen through the cracks of the system in, in the city of Thunder Bay. And it has, the relationship has to go beyond and just, just this panel, it has to go to a policing level where we get all the policing bodies together, where we have an exchange of dialogue of what those jurisdiction of policing bodies are, what are the frontline issues that policing deal with from an everyday basis, and
How are we going to engage in a, in a, in a capacity where we show Indigenous death rates in the provinces of Ontario? And how can, how can non-Native people assist First Nations people, not only just First Nations people, but chiefs in those lobbies, in those MP offices, and in, in federal offices? How are you guys going to show us to honor that silver covenant chain? You guys are bound by that to us as well, because you live here on our traditional lands and territories. How are you guys going to engage in a respectful reconciliation dialogue with us when, when our people are lost to the streets at such a magnitude? It's not just First Nations issues, it's, it's non-Native people that are dying on the street. So from a direct strategy perspective, what are we going to do as a city in terms of engaging First Nations people, engaging First Nations chiefs, aside from the Memorandum of Understanding. Okay. Thank you for the question, Mary. Um, certainly it is about developing relationships, and um, I, I sit on the Urban Aboriginal Advisory Committee as a, a guest who is invited to attend, and that's my opportunity to continue to, to make relationships and look at ways on how we can continue to work together. Um, also partner with um, Fort William First Nation and their addiction and wellness worker and continue to look at ways to work on relationships and, and work together. I don't have any easy answers other than um, I'm one sole person who is trying to make relationships and, and making relationships takes time. Um, I appreciate you coming out and asking those questions. I know you've come out to other events and have asked about specific data around how do, how do we delineate and find out numbers for Indigenous people in our community. And I recently found out when we were doing um, a report called uh, the Opioid Use and Impacts, we were looking at how do we find that. And when we request the data from the province, they actually strip the data from any anybody who is Indigenous. We don't get that. Um, however, Fort William First Nation did do a special request of information, had to provide all of their postal codes, and has recently received their overdose data specifically for their community members. So, you know, if there's a way that we can work on that together, I can provide input on how and who to connect with and how to make that specific request. Um, I'm, I'm open to continuing getting to know one another and getting to know others in our community uh, who want to work on this important issue. I think part of the question was also to Chief yeah. Gates. Okay. Um, uh, for my city and district services, we do have uh, First Nation paramedics. Uh, they we don't have a lot, to be perfectly honest. Uh, educational requirements for paramedics have been going up over the years just because of job is getting so complex. Uh, right now it's a two-year college program that they need to graduate uh, and then they need to get certified under a physician in order to work. Um, that program is actually going to become a three-year program come 2020 and that's just because of the amount of skills that are being uh, that are, are required of paramedics nowadays and what they do out there. Uh, we, uh, we do go to some recruitments and we do encourage uh, First Nations to, to, by all means, look at paramedic as a career. Uh, they're always welcome, and we would encourage them to apply. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, uh, panelists. I just want to applaud everybody for your hard work in the community and uh, for everybody for being here, of course, tonight for this important discussion. Thank you, Frank, for bringing us together. I just wanted to acknowledge as well all the hard work that's being done and um, and I think a lot of people don't understand the work that's being done in the community right now. And I think if the uh, chief of police was here, or the deputy chief, um, I mean, I was at a meeting recently where uh, crisis uh, management prevention is like actually becoming, many people might not know this, but a part of the whole policing mandate. And it's taken a lot, a lot of advocacy, like for decades and decades to get it to this point. It's going to take a lot of... Um, a lot of hard work and, and to, to continue uh, funding these projects, but they're really, really important. And um, I, I just, Janet, you had mentioned um, prevention um, being so critical and uh, early intervention. And uh, I just wanted to share a statistic with everybody. I, I talked to big brothers and sisters before I came here. I called them yesterday. 
to find out how many kids they had on their waiting list. So they currently have 25 um, young boys. They got no. They got. They are able to find pairs for for women. So they got 25 young boys between seven and 13 currently waiting for uh, for big brothers. And these are people with their hands out, like people asking for help, like mothers and fathers bringing their kids in and asking. And if we uh, if we're not there to to meet them. I mean, that's 25 kids, you know, that kind of breaks my heart. But uh, there's uh, maybe a little job there for any heroes in the community that want to uh, kind of be part of the, the, the long-term solution. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that. So, yeah, Just go ahead. Next, please. I got a few things to mention, my opinions, and a few questions. What the lady speaking about to do is people about the medical issues. Uh, we have a serious problem here at Thunder Bay Weather Hospital, obviously. Uh, you guys, whoever, city council, whatever, we had McKellar Hospital, General Hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital, we had three hospitals, we go to one. Now, I don't know where the logic is in that, but every surrounding community around here, reserves, whatever, come to Thunder Bay for medical help at one hospital. You went from three to one, with one hospital. Doesn't make sense, that math does not add up, I swear. Um, basically, I can see adding another one, the new one, and keeping the three, yeah, but not taking three away. Uh, that was wrong. Secondly, I think that uh, whoever did the architecture of the new hospital did it for fancy dancy and offered practical reasons. <laughs> and they made a really pretty hospital, but not practical, okay? And every, everybody sort of with a brain knows that there's industrial buildings that have flats, roofs and the purpose of a flat roof is so that way if you have to add on and like the best western arthur street you add on another level but not thunder bay hospital fancy dancy one level doesn't work at thunder bay i don't agree and i don't agree with people going to hospitals uh, the emergency is way too small for one hospital for the surrounding community and thunder bay um, Numbers on walls and hallways don't compensate beds and <laughs> rooms. Okay, that does not compensate that. I don't agree with numbers on walls. That is wrong again. Um, I believe a lot of the answer to this question here is you guys do something to that roof and maybe go up. And maybe check with the airport to see how far you can go up. My opinion, the holiday height, whatever restrictions, safety bylaws, whatever, if it can be done. That's the first thing I would recommend. Second thing, I don't think a hospital should be charging parking because people are going there to get sick, not to pay your fees, okay? They don't go pay to go with it, pay for People are going there for medical reasons, not to go, they're going there with a limp or so or this or that to the emergency, and they gotta go in their pocket and just get the five dollars which they don't have. You know, they don't got it. Like, you have a question for... Why are you Bob? charging for hospital if you're saying well, there's poor people and they can't afford it? Is it not there for people's help rather than make a buck? I know you got to keep, uh, you got to keep, uh, what do you call it, uh, parking lots and asphalt and this and that, and pretty, pretty, but... Okay, there's an answer coming. So just to clarify, uh, I have nothing to do with that. Yeah. And nobody else does here. <laughs> Are you provincial or federal people who I'm talking to here? No, there's no one here from the hospital. I'm municipal. You're a municipal? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And for poor poverty people, speaking, you say whatever. I'm going to say something new now, too. Well, about the hospital issue, what I recommend to solve that problem is the reserves should actually have their own hospitals built on the reserve, be it small, a house, this, that, whatever, have their own nurse and doctor, so that way they're not overcrowding Thunder Bay Hospital, one hospital. And if they don't prepare to do that, then they should obviously get more doctors and maybe build three more hospitals or bring our three hospitals back and our beds back. We need the beds, we need the hospitals. And if you're not provided to do that, I don't think that, I, I don't know, I should, I just think that's wrong, okay? But that's the, the, the one thing I have to say about the hospital situation. Okay. okay. Now, there is three people behind you. I know, but I'm going to say about the poor people now. Okay. Okay, yeah. poor people in Thunder Bay, $14 an hour, 40 hours per week. You want to know why there's crime and why there's drugs and why there's all this stuff? It's because there's no money in Thunder Bay. We own a hospital with jobs. They're the only ones that have jobs in Thunder Bay. We have no forestry. 
We have no manufacturing, nothing. And the reason why they're resorting to crime is because they don't have any money. So they gotta do something to live. They gotta make money. So that's what they resort to. Simple. And that's what they're, they're depressed, they're miserable, they're lonely, they've got no money, they're poor. And when you get a job making 40 hours per week at $14 an hour, if you do your math, it's going to be out to $1,500, I'd say $800, $900 clear every two weeks, which is about $1,800, $1,900 a month. You subtract your $800 rent, food, hydro, water, et cetera, et cetera. You've got no money left. And that's at one person working, maybe you get $1,500 clear a month. Clear. $1,600. Well, two people, $3,000 clear a month. But let's talk reality, math. Okay, Not. so let's someone answer if you if you want to about Grocery that, that question again. Yeah. So just regarding poverty, um, yeah, poverty. I I think that we all know that, and um, we've researched this in locally in Thunder Bay, is that poverty is one of the biggest indicators um, that people will not be able to meet the social determinants of life or just social determinants of health. People without money will not be able to get adequate housing, will not be able to get health care. They're, stuck, be able to they're join. stuck in a rut because so, they're on yeah, minimum so wage. Just, excuse me, let Excuse me, finish, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so, can you please? No, I just don't want to hear. Yeah, so I'd like oh, yeah. to answer Getting the question. Your question. And, yeah, um, so I think that that's a really important point that we understand that poverty can equate to people not having healthy lives. And that's a really important part. That's a really uh, important point. Healthy lives are money, man. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Okay. Poverty can equate to an unhealthy life. Yeah. But thank you very yeah. much. I appreciate yeah. it. I'll leave the, the podium, but with all due respect, in order to prevent crime and drugs and all that stuff, you need real jobs. Not transitional jobs that pay $14 an hour, hire them for two months and fire them. That's what Thunder Bay is. We need a manufacturing company with real jobs, not one hospital, supporting the whole, whole city because that's the only jobs we have. Okay, thank you very much for your points. Well taken. Please go ahead. Anna. Hello, panel. Thank you for your information tonight. I have to bring up uh, affordable housing, or rather, unaffordable housing. I work at a women's shelter, and we have um, women fleeing domestic violence, and um, it renders them homeless. So then we try and find housing for these individuals, and um, sometimes it's individuals, sometimes it's families um, with children. And I can tell you that it's, housing is very unaffordable. We've um, over-invested in housing so that it's profit-making, it's unattainable for people. There's a slew of motels on Cumberland that charge 250 a week to um, 1000 a month. Um, it's just enough to keep people at that level so they can't save first and last month's rent for a better circumstance and a better situation. Um, there's some social housing that I've had to place families into and I would not um, want to ever have to do that again. Um, it goes against my values and uh, conscience as a, a social worker. Are there easy solutions? No, but I watched a program um, with Steve Pakin last night and he said that, um, you know, we won't make any changes until we get developers and realtors and regulation in place that helps people. And um, um, so I really believe that, you know, we're in a housing crisis nationwide, you all know that. And, um, and also there's a need for harm reduction housing. So. If, imagine any of us went home tonight and we didn't have a home to go to, what that would be like. So it is a, you know, a, a determinant of health and um, it's a human right. Um, and so, um, you know, I don't know how the coalition is coming along with that, but um, Janet, you mentioned how, you know, investment dollars are um, going into health care, but not into mental health. And you know maybe we have to provide for some of those needs and fund that properly. The other thing I'd like to bring up was um, I was at some training last week and I was shocked and appalled to learn that we do not have a mental health court. And we have tremendous issues around mental health and alcohol and um, um, some of the social problems that go along with that. And 
we don't have a mental health court and we really should have that and apparently we've lost a bail program and a bunch of other services with um, um, John Howard Society so maybe there's some advocacy there so anyways I thank you and um, um, keep doing what you're doing thank you yes please go ahead can you please thank you very much for the comments about housing um, I just uh, there is funding out there, and I want to talk a little bit about the Ministry of Housing and the initiative, the initiative that the initiative they have. Um, so a few years ago, they established a vision. So this is across the province, um, and the vision was to eliminate chronic homelessness um, by 2025. I believe. Um, I encourage you to take a look if you can on the Ministry of Housing website, and the areas of focus are people who are chronically homeless. Um, youth, um, indigenous people, as well as people who are being discharged or released from um, provincially funded organizations like hospitals or jails. Um, recently, St. Joseph's Care Group um, and Delico working with, um, with DSAPS or service manager locally um, received some funding for um, uh, rent supplements and counseling supports for individuals who are chronically homeless and have substance use and mental health issues. We have 80 individuals on our caseload. So I just want to say that there are opportunities, and what we're trying to do is stay ahead of kind of the wave and look for the opportunities and, um, and, um, and take advantage of it. Another initiative that's coming forward is a 30 bed facility for transitional housing for people who have substance use issues. Hopefully, that will be in place in, um, in a few months from now. So there are initiatives out there, there is funding. It's not just in how. And that's why I said we all need to work together because it's different pockets of money and there are ways to kind of move forward. It's not tons of money, but it's some, and I think we just grab what we can. And just to add for the Third Bay Housing and Homelessness Coalition, um, we are actually what's called a community advisory board, uh, which receives federal dollars for housing initiatives. Uh, we don't receive a, a very significant amount, but we receive dollars that actually goes towards funding three specific programs in Thunder Bay. Um, previously, we received uh, some additional funding that supported um, the Out of the Cold program, which was one time. Um, but the programs that are supported through the federal dollars that come through are uh, the manager position for Quakewin, which is the managed alcohol program. The social navigator at John Howard Society, which helps really doing a lot of work at rehousing and, and supporting individuals. And then two transitional units through Alpha Court, which does addiction and mental health housing and supports individuals in the community more long term. It's not enough, and we will continue to advocate for more. Our community also receives through the, um, the Aboriginal Community Advisory Board, which is under the Urban Aboriginal Advisory Committee. They also receive federal dollars, and it supports the Nadawan program, which is a housing first program, um, which works with uh, all individuals, including families, and helps connect to um, landlords in the communities and provide that support to help people maintain housing. The, the issue becomes when we also don't have landlords uh, that are willing to rent to individuals in our community, and the rents are so high. Um, there have been new initiatives with, with DSAB and them being able to actually allow what's called portable um, rent supplements. So they will actually help augment some housing issues, uh, augment housing costs, um, and you can live in different types of housing so you don't have to live within social housing, um, but you also have to have landlords willing to work with, with you. Um, also, I just want to speak to the funding um, that takes place in Thunder Bay. Um, Cynthia spoke to the funding that comes from the federal government through the Homelessness Partnering Strategy. Um, and we don't get a lot of money. We get about $168,000 a year to fund all of the programs that Cynthia just spoke about. Um, and funding is piecemeal. I mean, our funding ends March 31st, 2019. Those programs, the, fun the funding is complete. And just to let you know how imperative these programs are, the uh, social navigator position um, at John Howard Society that Cynthia referred to is successfully housing 50 people a year that are coming out of um, jail and and, uh, and into that transitional housing and then into housing, permanent housing. So these funded um, uh, 
endeavors are really important. When we get a little bit of extra money, we make sure it goes to uh, towards um, towards these endeavors as well. So we got a little bit of extra money, so instead of Alpha Court being able to offer two transitional units, this year they'll be able to offer four transitional units. So um, our Housing and Homelessness Coalition Advisory Board works very hard. Um, we also apply for other grants. We were successful in applying for uh, receiving a Trillium grant to help the out of the cold program. We're in the process of right now of applying for another Trillium grant to ensure that the out of the cold program can continue. So we worked really hard um, to make sure that all of that can happen in Thunder Bay. Okay, before we go to the next question, I have one from before from Facebook, so we'll alternate quickly. I have a question for Chris, Dr. Chris from uh, on mental health and for children and youth. There seems to be uh, an increase in um, the stress related or addiction or mental health for uh, youth in universities, in the school, in the education system. Would you be able to expand and see what is that happening? Is this something new? Is it emerging? What factors are bringing that forward? And what, I mean, you're related, you're doing that work in that field. What can you expand and provide some information that doesn't seem to be out there yet? Thank you for the question. And I forgot to acknowledge all the folks out on Facebook uh, when, I, when I said hello. So. Uh, all over Facebook. Um, you know, the, that's one of the things that that's a, a, a seems to be an emerging issue. Uh, uh, but at the same time, the data uh, uh, are a little bit unclear at times. So, um, the one thing I will say is that um, that sort of university late adolescence age is, is a is a time of transition for everybody. It's a very uh, important time, and a lot of stresses are kind of coming in all together at the same time. If you think back to when you were 17 years old. You know, on one hand, you, you, you've got this um, youthful kind of um, uh, enthusiasm for what, what the world holds, but at the same time, uh, you've got the, the, the realities and pressures of, of you know, finishing school and, and, and dealing with your friends and, 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 and listening to your parents and all those other kinds of things. You know, and that's, that's in sort of a, 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 a sort of normative, typically developing kind of picture. Um, but that's not always the case, right? So, so sometimes you know, young people uh, have a lot of different experiences before that, um, um, stressors that happen um, um, very, very early in life that, uh, that, that then kind of lead to um, uh, a higher likelihood of, uh, of difficulties when they're, when they're older. Now, what I will say is that, you know, that I'm talking about on average here, so you know we're, we're very good at predicting things at the population level. We can we can predict percentages of the population level, but at any one individual level, it's it's not always the case because individuals, of course, have different capacities and, and different resilience and, and different things they can draw upon. So when when I am speaking of this, I'm speaking it on average. One of the one of the things that I, I think is, is happening as well is that um, you know there are. Um, there are, are new realities that, 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 that are emerging very, very quickly that we've not really planned for, we've not really understood. I mean, had you, had you explained to me 10 years ago even that, that I'd, I'd be sitting here talking to a thousand people on the internet, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that those kinds of things you know, were going to happen. Uh, maybe for me, maybe everyone else predicted it and I'm, I'm just haven't figured it out yet. But, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we hear from young people is that you know, when you have difficulties with people at school, it used to be when you got home, the people at school you had difficulties with weren't at home, so you at least got a bit of break from that. Um, but now, the people that you have difficulties at school are buzzing your phone until all hours of the day, and you, you don't get that same relief. Uh, so you see increasing anxieties, you know, you see a, a lot of uh, uh, media reporting about negative things, you know, uh, that I think make us all feel nervous and hopeless. But if you look at, you know, even global statistics about things like poverty, you know, we've cut global poverty, uh, I think, in half since the year 2000. Like, you know, we're, we're making tremendous, tremendous gains globally on, on things that, that because they're outside of the scope of our day-to-day -day lives, we don't always know about, you know. And, and I think that um, the, the current climate in, in, in social media, et cetera, really concentrates a lot of negative stuff very, very quickly and, and kind of creates an environment where it becomes hard not to listen to that. The other piece is, is that I think that sometimes in trying to help young people uh, in a very well-meaning way through education systems, through other other programs, we, we may be accidentally undermined. 
and, and what I mean by that is that, you know, when, when I think about, so, so I, can, I can pick someone here and ask you, you know, what did you get on your grade six geography test? And you won't remember. You have, you have no idea what you got on that. But in grade six, you might have been pretty stressed about that geography test. And, and we may have tried to do something to help to support you that. I mean, probably 20 years ago, we didn't do much to help you support that. We just said, take it, you know. And, and, and you'll remember that, you'll know now that you, know, you got through it. And getting through it is actually a, a really important kind of thing. Um, and I think sometimes when we, we, we create uh, sort of systems that, that, that are, are well-meaning but accidentally undermine um, um, learning and, 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 and ability to tolerate distress, the ability to, um, to, to learn skills to manage difficulties. So I think, you know, it's a very, very complex, it's a great question, it's very complex, uh, and, but it, it's, it's related to a whole bunch of things that are both external and internal to individuals, families, and communities. Um, but I will say, I was doing some reading, um, and there was a really great collection of quotes that people have written about the, the young people. And these quotes went, were from the from, from present times, they were from the 70s and the 40s and the 20s. And 2,000 years ago, uh, philosophers were writing about how entitled the young people are and how they don't want to work and how they, you know, and then in the, in the 1800s they were saying the same thing. So I, I see it as always, it's always sort of this hindsight bias where we always sort of have, have that conversation going and I think what we're really responding to is is developmental changes and, and, and what happens naturally for young people when they when they transition through those really formative formative years. You have to remember, you know, you're not the same person now that you were when you were 17 and the 17 year olds you, you, you know now they're not going to be the same person when they're 27, 37, 47 either. So um, I think if we have a developmental perspective, we, we, we're in a place where we can have a lot of good conversation about that. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, Frank. Uh, I'm Laurie Paris. I want to thank these two gentlemen for letting me come and sp uh, speak first because I have to drive a young lady home. Uh, just quickly, I want to say that I've worked with uh, some people up on this panel. Uh, Cynthia, for one, Leanne Chevret, bringing to downtown Fort William some, some events that really helped in getting to know the neighborhood, et cetera, like, like that. But when, tonight, what I really noticed was the theme of women. Women only making 71 cents as opposed to men making you know, a, you know, a dollar. Um, women in poverty, the women and children in poverty, First Nation women in poverty, women, women, women. Until we change our culture on how we treat women in this country, in the world, but especially if we just start in Thunder Bay to change that culture, we will change what goes on here. As a woman in recovery for 27 years, I know, and I was told many years ago when I started in business, don't tell anybody that. You'll never get a job, you'll never get a loan. That culture has to change because you can not only survive but thrive. I had two young daughters and if they would have taken care of me on social assistance when I had to do that so I could sober up, they would have helped me. And not just everything was for the children. I was appreciative that, that they gave them dental care but if they would have taken care of me, the mother, I could take care of my children. Take care of the mothers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before we go to the next question, the, if there is an opportunity to touch on the, the issue of stigma and addiction, I think that's also a big one in terms of moving forward towards recovery. Thanks. Let's go ahead. Uh, yes, good evening. My name is Brian McInnes, and I'm the chair of the board at PACE, which is People Advocating for Change Through Empowerment. I also sit on the Northwest Center of Responsibility, which they have the situation table locally, where the police are going to be starting to have frontline mental health workers to go with them to help in these crises. But the big issue that a number of people have mentioned is affordable housing. I see constantly on Facebook, oh, no, they're going to put in an injection site. We've got to start somewhere. And these people that say that are the same people, yes, I get upset when I hear about violent crimes being committed for opiates or whatever. But these people, as has been said, every one of them people is somebody's mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, grandson, granddaughter. Some of these people didn't choose this addiction. Some of them do want to help. Uh, the other thing that bothers me greatly, as I see constantly 
all this stuff, these people that have been found floating in the river. If the police were made aware that there was a bunch of people running around the roof of an abandoned grain elevator, they would go there and do something about it. But when you go down by the Thunder Center and see up to a dozen people can hardly stand up staggering around the shore of the river, why don't they do something? I don't want to hear about another body being found in the river. Is something going to be done about that? What did pull it? You want to answer? Hi, Brian. Hey. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll touch on one thing in particular, which is around uh, public intoxication and some of the risky issues that happen. Um, we know we have quite a few uh, visible uh, public intoxication, whether it's from beverage alcohol, so the traditional kind of alcohol that you can purchase at a liquor store or now at grocery stores, even Walmart, um, you can get beer. Um, with this expanse of alcohol availability, we will continue to see the increase in alcohol-related harms in our community. We know that we have over 50% of our adults drinking above the lowest drinking guidelines. Um, and then there are some individuals who are drinking very much in excess, and sometimes they're consuming uh, what's called traditionally non-beverage alcohol or surrogate alcohol, so things like hand sanitizer, mouthwash, etc. Um, there are a lot of complicating factors that uh, lead individuals to be in that position, um, and unfortunately, many of those individuals don't have the uh, luxury of having a home. I can go home tonight and I can have a few drinks and it be in the privacy. I can even get drunk and it would be in the privacy of my own home. Um, but if you don't have a home, you are relegated to be out or maybe finding a place that's unsafe so that you are a little ways from, from things that are visible and maybe putting yourself in danger by being close to the rivers. Certainly the drug strategy is actually investigating um, how to better support individuals uh, to provide a space where people can consume on site. I think it's something important that we need to consider as a measure to um, early engagement, meet people where they're at. Maybe it's the first time we say we care about you as an individual and we'll accept you in the condition that you are in. And if you're ready or willing for some other kind of services and support that we may be able to assist you with, that we can do that. But one of the first steps for some of those individuals would be that very early intervention um, even different than the managed alcohol program. And that program is full anyways, it's 15 beds, it's full. Yeah. So. Yeah, well perhaps that may be a good idea to have a safe consumption site for them <laughs> as opposed to that. But And then I hear lots of people that get upset that they'll, they'll harass you for money and cigarettes. Yeah, that bothers me. But what bothers me is when I see somebody that you can barely stand up, I go home thinking, is that person going to be found in the river? And that's concerning to me. That's tragic. Thank you. We have four more Thank you. questions behind. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Norm Legault. Um, I just moved up to Thunder Bay in, I guess, July of last year. Um, so I'm relatively new to the city. Um, uh, I just wanted to have, uh, just sitting in on a few meetings here throughout the city, trying to understand the issues. And um, So when I extrapolate some of the numbers that you guys talked about, of 100,000 people, 12% are indigenous, which represents 12,000 people. And then they said 50% of the people in the poverty, quote, poverty are, are indigenous. So that represents 7,500 out of 15,000. So that works out to 62.5%. No, sorry, I'll just correct you. Okay. 50% of the people living below the low income measure, which is 50, yeah, so 7,500 people, exactly. So yeah, you can see the huge disparity there. So 62.5% of the people who are below the poverty line are indigenous. So my only, my question, I have a couple of questions. So one is, uh, why isn't there a larger representation of indigenous people on the city or um, to address like more buy-in, um, to help uh, get buy-in and, and get more concrete uh, Maybe there is, and, and I'm not. I'm not educated on that. 
Um, and then the other question is um, just about the, uh, the services. And I, I guess that gentleman here uh, probably addressed my uh, question, which is, is you guys in the, on the EMS are doing uh, some work out in the field. Can you do a joint uh, thing involving a mental health person coming to cut down on the number of calls and repeat calls? So I think that you guys are how, already have that in terms of applying for funding for LINT. Um, and um, uh, so I think that's most of my questions. And then just regarding the uh, comment about jobs, and um, I attended a meeting with uh, Mr. Puglia there uh, about a week ago for the chamber, and uh, they're saying there's a large skills gap of employees. So there's a huge gap of employees who don't have uh, for the workforce for skilled labor. So I work for Resolute Force. We are that company is looking for skilled labor. They're focused on working with First Nations people, um, they're, and they're focused on hiring females, women employees. So there's a huge focus with that company, and they employ about a thousand people in northwestern Ontario. So there is still forestry in northwestern Ontario. And I believe that they've hired 450 people in the last three years. They're going to hire at the mill, and of the 35, the sawmill, there's more. And it's on the first uh, four billion nation. So um, I guess that's my, my comment. So that, that there is uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, and I wanted to commend everybody here the, for the hard work they've been doing and uh, with the resources they have. And thank you for coming forward. As, yep. uh, uh, large employer, we don't hear from the large employers in Canada very often. Mm -hmm. It's great to know that there are job opportunities, and you're right. At any given time, there are almost a thousand jobs in Thunder Bay, highly paid, good qualifications required, but they're there and they cannot be filled because we have a higher percentage of an aging population, four percentage point above the provincial average. I've been on the workforce uh, planning board for years, and we've been predicting this for, for a while, but we're not the only ones. All the Western uh, countries, Western societies, that mature economies are facing this challenge of matching, and you heard the comments, that's going to be the greatest challenge for the next 10, 20 years. As the baby boomers retire, who's going to replace them? So training, and uh, it's going to be key, and also tapping into the human capital available in the indigenous communities. This in, in youth and, and others, women, uh, people with uh, disabilities, and those, those opportunities there. And just to let you know, the city of Turner Bay has done an equity inventory, an equity survey of uh, self-declared indigenous people, and we are hiring. We are hiring the about 8% four years ago. It was about 8, 8.5%, which was the population uh, a large that was indigenous population about eight and a half, now is around 10. And then sur the recent survey it should be coming out soon, and I'm assuming we'll be trending about the same. So the city of Turner Bay has, and very few people know that. Even when I mention it to people that would be in the know, they're surprised about those numbers. Because it's not something that you can see visibly. There are, you know, so you have to be self-declared. So we do the survey, and we are, Pleasantly surprised to see that over between eight and a half to ten percent of our employees are self-declared indigenous people. So at least the city of Tampa Bay is doing its part. So, but thank you for your points and your questions. Uh, please, uh, next one, next, please come forward. Thank you. Um, my name is Penny Radford. I have worked with um, high-risk children for over thirty-four years, um, from Kenora to Thunder Bay. Um, 25 years spent in, in residential services for youth. Um, I can't say enough of what a disconnect there has been with youth and children, and especially children who are diagnosed with disorders. Um, there are no, I'm not gonna say there's no. There are some programs for sure that service these kids, and there are some services that are out there I get concerned about things like where we're going to have social workers uh, ride along with police, which is great, um, but I still want to know where they're referring the people because everything is full. The doors are closed. The seats are full. Um, I, I, I just wonder when we will stop creating services that provide for five more. 
and why we can't find services that create for a hundred more. And I get it that, there, that there's funding issues, but we also are in a city that is huge, has a huge academic program. We have the university, we have the local colleges, we have the Con College, we have the medical university. Um, and, and, and I hear, and, and I used to be the executive director as well for Big Brothers Big Sisters, and I hear that about the 25 boys. Are these the same 25 we were sitting with last year, the two years before? Probably. And why is it that we're not getting people in to work with these kids? because there's kids that are being referred into these because parents don't know where else to go for help and we are disconnected from our kids when years ago there were truancy officers, right? Show up at your door if you just skipped out of school, well they showed up at mine anyways. Okay. But um, social workers were there. Um, people were there to support youth and they were all over the place and kids could find them. They were around the corner, they were at uh, drop-in nights, teen, teen drop-ins, um, children drop-ins, play groups. They were everywhere. Kids could find us. Kids are even becoming more disconnected and we're becoming more disconnected with them because of social media and parents scared to let their bloody kids out the door, right? And so we have to find where these kids are and our kids with disorders, there are more and more children being diagnosed with anxiety disorders and FASD and um, ADHD and dis all kinds of disorders, right? But there are no services to service them. I work in a program right now where the staff ask me every day, where can we go with the kids where they feel inclusive? Nowhere, they're full. There's nothing. So in knowing that we have a huge academic program and, and, and it's a huge city for that. When we got medical, all the colleges and the LU, um, I'm wondering where we can pull in from that, where all those young people who are role models that are in school and even training for psychology and social workers and child and youth workers and, well, they canceled that program because they weren't needed, but Something to be said about that, a disconnect. And I'm just wondering when we will connect with those people of that population and the academics to help us solve some problems here. Thank you. Anyone? It's a, it's a, it's a very good question. I, 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 I don't speak for like a university. Um, I don't speak for the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. I, I have an employee there. Uh, but no, I mean, the, young, the university undergraduates are, are of capacity there, and, and and there are initiatives that are that are underway. I, I'm not I'm not up on all of them, obviously, um, but you know, concrete connections between things like Big Brothers and the university. If those connections don't exist, that that's a very 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 good idea, right? So it's like, how do we uh, how do we bring those ideas forward after this? And I think that those are conversations we have to keep pursuing uh, when we walk out the door today. And uh, it's one of the benefits of getting so much. Um, so much brain power in the room together is that we kind of get, we kind of have that opportunity to, to, to move these things forward. So thank you for your comments, it's a great idea. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention briefly um, um, a research project that's happening through the Poverty Reduction Strategy from the Wellesley Institute in Toronto, the Sports and Success Program, really looking at what you're talking about, a collective impact around youth, um, and looking at what gaps there are, what barriers there are. Um, but not just looking at that, but getting folks together who work uh, with children um, in all areas, children and youth, um, from prenatal to career. And that's the goal, that's the focus of that research project. So, um, and there are a couple of others going on in, in the city right now too. So it is something that um, is uh, definitely a priority for the poverty reduction strategy right now. And I know other strategies too. I just wanted to say thank you for your comments, and as a service provider within the healthcare industry, I would say we love a doubt that there are disconnects across the system. Yeah, or you look at the it, it, It's across the board, and the funding is disconnected. So there's the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, the Ministry of Community and Social Services, the Ministry of Education, there's the Ministry of Health, and they're all providing, we're trying to provide services for youth, and everyone will say, and I will say as a service provider, there are not, not enough resources to do it. There are not enough resources to meet the need. And so then it's how can we use the resources we have
active data work across all those ministries and outside that provincial, municipal, federal, whatever it is. I will also say, and I won't make a political comment because I can't, um, that the, the provincial budget did identify on the mental health and addiction side more funding for youth. And so whatever happens with that, I would say without a doubt there's an acknowledgement to what you're saying. There is a need for more funding so services for youth and to connect youth to the right providers at the right time. And there's another initiative across the province that's being established called Youth Hubs. And they're just beginning, but it's again, to have the services for youth in the place where youth are going to be. We don't have all the answers, but I certainly, we, we're all experiencing exactly what you're saying, regardless of where you're working in the system. So, thank you. Thank you. We have uh, 15 minutes left. So five minutes each, please go ahead. Keep your question and answer I don't know. Hi, I'm Natalie Stilbert. I do volunteer outreach work at Ground Zero here. One of my main concerns is the stigma and the lack of education on addiction. Um, I don't want to get into choice model versus medical model. My, my, okay, the Government of Canada, I'm going to read their definition, defines stigma as negative attitudes and beliefs about a group of people due to their circumstances in life. Stigma involves discrimination and prejudice. Furthermore, the government indicates that stigma is also negative judging, labeling, isolating, and stereo stereotyping. In Thunder Bay, I see a lot of social shaming going on with those with substance abuse problems, are homeless. I would like to know what education can be done towards the general pub public to stop the stigma that is going on and further crushing people, crushing those that are already crushed from their, their social problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a passion of mine to, to dismantle stigma for sure. Um, yeah, an area of focus that the drug strategy has done around education has tended to lead towards professionals to, you're, you're preaching to the choir kind of thing, right? Um, so certainly uh, we have recognized that we need to do more outreach, more uh, connection with community, with general public about the issues around stigma. Our Recovery Day movement is really one venue to try and talk about stigma, reduce stigma, and to talk about the celebration that recovery happens and people can be along the continuum of recovery. So that's our one special day that we will say that that's where we're going to try and do that. Um, but we have, uh, as far as our prevention and education group, and same with our harm reduction group, we're starting to talk about um, doing something similar to this. Um, AMAs, Ask Me Anything, uh, this is something new that I've never heard of before, but Reddit's where you can go online and people can ask, and so we want to have opportunities that the, invite the public to ask questions and that we can give expert advice back, um, but have a conversation about it. Maybe do more town hall sessions, Facebook Live, like, hello, I'm not used to doing that. Um, but, but those would be the things that we are definitely looking at doing over the next several years. Um, we won't be able to do them on a very regular basis, but as, as often as we can, we need to take those opportunities. So that's why I took Councillor Cooley up on the opportunity to come here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, please. Yeah, I just wanted, Natalie, if I can make one more, uh, just one more comment. Um, we've come a long way with respect to stigma. If we look at where we were five years ago, Frankly, someone who was in a political office would not mention the word mental health or substance use or addiction. Mm -hmm. We have come a long way, and I will say we have a long way to go. A number of years ago, I worked with a gentleman, um, his name was Dr. Arbolito Flores, and he was working with the World Health Organization on stigma. And he said, ask yourself or ask your friends or ask your colleagues these questions. One, would you engage with an individual, and I'll use the word substance use because that was your comment, would you engage with a person would you invite someone who has a substance use issue to your home for dinner? Would it be okay if your daughter or son married someone who has a substance use issue? If the answer to that is, well, no, then why? If the person has another chronic illness, is it okay? The hearing loss, the diabetes, or something else. So we have a long way to go. Um, you could put mental health issue or whatever in there. But I think it's what will be accepted into our lives what's, what's important to us and what do we push away. And it's,
Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending here and sharing your time with us. My name's Andrew. Um, I'm just wondering if you can help me understand the value in continuing the point in time uh, counts versus using the homeless individuals and families information system uh, or broadly across Thunder Bay and services. So we do use the HIFAS system, that's the short form for what you're talking about. The HIFAS system is used in the point in time count. It's the mechanism we use to enter all of the data. So you're using the HIFAS system now to collect all of the data? Exactly. Are, so what are we do all is of we the service providers using HIFAS in Thunder Bay? They're getting on board. There's a few right now, but um, right now, um, HIFAS is changing a little bit, so it becomes um, mobile, so you can use it um, from uh, remote sites. You don't have, it doesn't have to be connected to a, a server on site. So there are some organizations that want to use HIFAS, but they're kind of waiting for that next HIFAS to come in, which is here now, and it's just starting to get rolling. But HIFAS is, um, what you're really talking about is a coordinated access for people to, um, to be able to gain housing and the supports around that. And that is on the top of the radar for uh, Thunder Bay right now as far as housing and homelessness. Can I just add one more thing? Yeah. So we don't necessarily we have, have, minutes, so we don't necessarily have a choice about the point in time count. We are actually mandated by the federal government Appreciate to conduct it. Um, at twelve ciphers. But to to do a homeless enumeration by the provincial government, yeah. So the federal HPS does not mandate us to do no. it. They, they strongly urge us. Yeah, they, they urge us. us. They strongly yeah. encourage us to do the point in time count. The first time we did do it, um, that was some of the, the, that's what we were essentially told, and then it did shift a bit. Okay. Provincial government has also mandated service managers, and so that's where the expansion of what the point in time count looks like this year in our community partnering with DSAP and doing some of the district communities. But we don't necessarily have a choice about it. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I realize your time is running short. I want to ask a very quick, simple question. How are you folks prioritizing uh, homeless people who have tuberculosis right now and, and finding housing for those folks? <laughs> Thank you. That's a really, really good question. Um, we as service providers have been working closely with the health unit, so it begins with the health unit to monitor and identify and monitor and, um, and work with individuals who have tuberculosis. And they work with them to ensure that they're protecting themselves and the public, so they're in hospital. They potentially move to another hospital location. There are other specialty hospitals in, um, in Ontario who work with people who have tuberculosis. And then when they are um, no longer infectious, they come back to Thunder Bay, then we're working with our housing partners to ensure that they have access to housing with supports. The numbers are not high, but they're numbers, and they're people, and I believe someone said that it was, it was you when know, talking about their individuals and people, and oftentimes, um, or sometimes, people will also have substance use and mental health issues, so we're doing our part to support them when they come back to the community. But we are working with the health community. And I'm not the best person to answer that. I'm just sort of on the outside. Being a support person, it goes back to we all need to work together. So I'll get called and say, is there anything that you can do that we will step in? So it's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. My question is for everyone here and at home. Are you, are we going to bring these issues both federally and provincially during the next election period? because that's our job too. That's not, we have a distinguished panel here. Well, it's our job to make those issues known provincially and federally. So that question is for everybody here and at home. Don't forget to do your part. Thank you. Thank you, and on that note, thank you for bringing that up. On that note, I wanna thank all of you for coming out tonight to be part of this. Thank you to our panel for your great insight Thank you for your participation, for your great work. And uh, you know, if we have learned something tonight is that we need, there's no order of government or any organization that can solve this complex problem alone. We need to work together in collaboration 
and move forward towards finding some practical solutions while we lobby and work with all orders of government, including municipal government. You know, as a council, as a child advocate, has been my privilege to serve the community and find out what the needs are for children and youth. And tonight, you also have me contributed that some high-level information and sharing of information that will help me do my job better. So thank you for everyone to come out. Thank you for those who are watching on Facebook. Thanks for your participation. The video will be on my Facebook page. It can be viewed uh, anytime in, in the future. So for those who were not able to make it, everything has been recorded. It's there online for your follow-up. And then send me the rest of your questions. And uh, on behalf of all of us here, I think we'd all like to sh thank you, Frank, for putting together this town hall. And a special applause for the uh, panelists. Thank you very much.